Greetings, everyone. Ray here. Uh, before we start with episode 69, there's just something I wanted to point out real quick that I think will help make this episode make more sense and will be more enjoyable to listen to. Um, the Metexas line, the Greek defensive line, was actually in two separate parts. Um, the line that was just under the Bulgarian border was called the IB line, as in the Italy-Bulgaria line. And that, that line was to stop in case both countries attacked at the same time. The line to the west, where the main Italian attack comes to, was called the IBA line, like a subset. Uh, that was built after the first line that was in the east. The one on the west had semi-permanent fixtures, and so the Greeks aren't going to have as much trouble backing up when that gets breached. So just just keep in mind that it's all considered the Metexas line, but the one in the East that really doesn't get challenged because Bulgaria doesn't come in is the IB line, and the one in the west where the main action is at is called the IBA line. Um, they're all part of the same line, but I use the IB and the IBA, and as long as you keep that in your head when you're listening, everything will make a lot more sense and you'll be able to enjoy it a lot more. Thank you very much. <laughs> And thank you for listening to the History of World War II Podcast, Episode 69, Greek Fire, Part 2. Amergenza G, or Contingency G, as in Greece, Italy's code name for this operation, had commenced. The rain and cloud cover initially canceled out Italy's main advantage, air power and artillery. But still, things were going well. Of course... The valley before the main offensive units was purposefully left open. And while the invaders struggled against the elements, Greek soldiers were moving back to or toward their defensive lines. General Praska's invasion plan was thus. The Siena Division, 9,200 men and about 50 guns. The Ferrara Division, 12,785 men and 60 guns and an auxiliary force of 3,500 Albanian volunteers, and the Asantaro Division, 163 light tanks, 4,000 men, and 24 pieces of artillery and anti-aircraft weapons, all together would cross the Albanian Greco border, head south, and make straight for the town of Kalpaki in northwest Greece. The only major obstacle before Kalpaki, besides the mountains, was the river Kalama, located about 20 miles north of the town. If the Italians could make it to the river, establish a bridgehead that would serve as a defensive line, they would dominate the area and have time to bring up their reinforcements. Once reinforced, they could push on to Kalpaki and then on to Ionina, further south. Ionina was the largest town in the Iparos area and served as the main Greek communication center and supply base. What's more, as Ionina was parallel with Mount Olympus, located on the east coast, the invaders would have gone a long way to cutting the country in half. If Ionina could be reached, the remaining path was clear. Ionina led to Larissa, 133 miles to the east, which led to Athens. 204 miles away. Checkmate. Because Mussolini emphasized speed, General Prasca did not want this main thrust hampered on their flanks. So, the Italian invasion force would be protected on its right flank, along the Adriatic coast, by the Littoral Group, made up of the 3rd Grenadier Regiment, 3,082 men and four pieces of artillery, as well as the 2nd Cavalry Regiment, 1,740 men, along with two mule-drawn batteries, along with 200 Albanian volunteers. Besides protecting the right flank, because no one expected heavy resistance there, the littoral group would continue on further south and capture the important port city of Preveza. Protecting the left flank of the main forces would be the Julia Division, with its 10,800 men 20 pieces of artillery, and reputation for efficiency. They were to march parallel with the main invasion force and take control of the Pindus area, 
General Prescott, believing his own propaganda, was also ready if there was a complete breakdown of Greek morale and resistance. If that happened, all plans would be ignored and a forced march would be made on the capital. Reserves would not be waited on. But it would be the Julia Division, after faring better than all the other Italian advances, that found itself losing almost nine out of every ten men during their retreat within the next few days. The Second Greek Corps would be their tormentors. Northeast of the Julie Division, the Macedonian area was the responsibility of the Parma Division. 12,000 men, 163 light tanks, and 60 field guns. Their job, as they were located near the point where the borders of Yugoslavia, Greece, and Albania met, was more of a holding action, while the main Greek resistance further west was broken. But they, too, were ready to race to Athens or drive to the east coast, if the Greeks faltered. And General Prescott, like Mussolini, like Hitler, judged other men by his own standards. So, the Arezzo Mountain Infantry, 12,000 men, 32 guns, and the Venencia, 10,000 men, and five groups of artillery divisions, guarded the Albanian-Yugoslav frontier, further north, just in case Yugoslavia decided to deal in a little treachery. And finally, the Pimonte Division, 9,300 men and 32 field guns, was held back in reserve in Albania. As on any invasion map, the lines are clear, the responsibilities are direct. The plan, Prescott assumed, would go forward and the enemy would do as they were predicted to, almost as if they had been given a copy of of contingency G, but the weather didn't, and by the end of the first day of fighting, the Italian infantry was moving on without their tanks, artillery, and vaunted air cover, and what they left behind wasn't Italy's best. Those tanks and artillery pieces were in North Africa, pointed at the British. However, the Italian troops were well served with the weapons on their person. They carried the Manlisha 6.5 and the Mauser 7.92 rifles, the Hotchkiss 6.5 light machine guns, or the Schwerlose 7.92 machine guns, and Brandt mortars. And their stockpile of mortars were what the Greeks could only dream of. Still, the highly trained and motivated defenders would turn out to make far better use of what mortars they had. But this battle just like every other battle in history, was not meant to be a fair fight. Gone were the days of chivalry and the idea that the better man would win. Taking what had worked so effectively when Albania fell, Governor General of Albania Francesco Iacomoni had groups of Albanian saboteurs organized. Their job, now that hostilities had begun, was to make their way across the border disrupt Greek communications, incite the locals to rebel against Metexas, and attack Greek outposts. Ironically, though it probably escaped the governor-general, the Albanians took their payment and then faded away. Fifth Greek column elements were just as unsuccessful. Those designated to stir up insurrection were locked up or neutralized within hours after the war started by Manny Adakis' secret police. On came the Italians, slow but steady. On, too, came the Greeks, towards their defensive line, its location unknown to the invaders, mostly because the clouds and rain grounded their reconnaissance flights. The Centauro Division slugged forward, their goal the bridge on the Kalama River near Kalpaki. The valleys before them were quiet, so they continued on. Occasionally, gunfire burst out somewhere else, always somewhere else. But it never turned out to be what the Italians expected. Soon, the Greek frontier posts were reached. The invaders found food stocked away and recent newspapers lying on tables. But no Greek defenders were seen. The first day of fighting was over. The next day, October 29th, 
The rain continued. As the Italians of the Littoral and Siena divisions pushed on, they came across streams that were now rivers. Floating by in the rushing waters were parts of trees, dead cattle, but most importantly, pieces of bridges the Greeks destroyed. As the invaders either didn't bring or left behind bridging equipment, their advance was slowed all the more. Thus far, any fighting between the two sides was limited to skirmishing. The Italians moved forward as fast as they could, but the Greeks continued to stay just beyond their range. Also that day, the plan to take the island of Corfu was delayed, as the weather still hampered the Italian air force. The next day, October 30th, was no different. However, there was action of a sort in Athens. Prime Minister Metexas met with the owners and editors of the Greek newspapers in Athens. Naturally, he wanted their help in presenting the best case possible for their beleaguered country. He then told them that he had done everything he could over the last few years to avoid war. But also, he did everything he could to prepare Greece for this same war. He then finished with, at the end of this war, though that may be far off, Britain would be on the winning side. Simply, it was Churchill's speech of June 1940 when he said, We shall fight, if necessary, alone on our island, that convinced the Greek leader of this. But the British Prime Minister was about to disappoint Metexas. On October 30th, Churchill told Palare, the British ambassador, to inform the Greeks that Britain did not feel obliged by the British Franco Pact of April 1939. Simply that France of that agreement was gone. However, fortuitously, Palare stalled in delivering this deplorable message that would have crushed Greek morale and later destroyed it altogether on Churchill's word. It was October 31st that saw the first casualty reports reach General Prescott's desk, not that he was overly concerned, as Mussolini had ordered. Skirmishes were increasing as Prescott's men moved further south. That day, at least three Italian officers and 30 other men were killed in action. Finally, the weather broke on November 1st. The Italians wasted no time in sending in their bombers to support their main force pushing south, and they needed the help. On that day, the invaders had reached the IBA line, or Italy-Bulgaria A line, also known as the Metexas line. In western Greece, where the main attack was, the Metexas line was called the IBA line. It had been constructed after the main defensive line further west so its fortifications were semi-permanent. To the east, the IB line was supposed to halt an attack from Bulgaria, but they, as the Greeks would eventually figure out, were sitting this one out. As the IBA line in the west had been breached, the Greeks backed up, but maintained their cohesion and handed the Italians heavy casualties for their gains. The Greek First Corps grudgingly gave ground as the Italians, with intense air support now, crossed the Kalima River. The Italians kept trying to push south past the river, but their casualties were rising. Resistance stiffened. The Greeks were conscious of only being 40 miles away from Ionina. But for the Italian pilots, it wasn't a picnic either. The mountains made their bomb runs inaccurate, and dangerous. And in one instance, a young Greek pilot, inspired by the British pilots, ignored orders to support ground troops and instead dropped his bombs on a fighter base at Koritza in Albania. At least 30 Italian pilots were killed. With clear skies, Prescott's desire was to push equally along all fronts now that his troops can be supported in the air. However, the Greeks, who had been moving men into place since the 28th, made the first move. At the far left end of the Italian line, or right end of the Greek line, 
General Papagos released the Greek forces there at 8 a.m. Their goal was to make for the Divoli River in southeastern Albania. If that could be reached, Greece would control the Morava area. This move would also threaten to cut off the Italian units pushing south from their main base. The Greeks rose up from their hiding places in the mountains and forest, looking strangely like British troops with their khaki uniforms and British-style helmets. The Parma division, standing opposed to these Greeks, felt the Greek counterattack first. How were the Greeks able to achieve a complete surprise? Firstly, the Italians had no reason that they could think of why the Greeks would counterattack at all. They too believed Prescott's propaganda. Secondly, the aggressors climbed up hills and other heights the Italians considered impossible to ascend, thus catching the Italians off guard. And these were the Evzones, who were selected and specially trained for such out-of-the-box thinking. They got into position and were soon raiding mortars down on Italian positions. And just like the Italians, the Evzones saw speed as the key component to their success. They continued to move, never stopping, completely overrunning the defensive lines of the Italians, all the while heading toward Treni and Vernicu further west in central Albania. Not sure what was going on, the Pimonte division was brought forward to stem the flood and repair the rupture. But the angry Greeks had the momentum, and the Pimonte division soon found themselves running alongside the fearful Parma troops. The confusion was such that a true report of the disaster did not make it back to Prasca until the next day, November 2nd. Also on the 2nd, the news that Greek forces had pushed the Italians back into Albania was reported to the world. But it was hard to know what to believe, and confirmation at this point was difficult, to say the least. Also by November 2nd, British help had arrived from Egypt. The gladiator fighters from No. 13 Blenheim Squadron clashed with the Italian Air Force. Their bombers struck at Italian positions. However, all the British planes involved were older and slower models. Numbers 84 and 211 Blemen squadrons would come over later in the month, along with number 80 Gladiator Squadron. Again, all inferior aircraft. But the British pilots did their best. To prove this, not one of them survived the conflict. But honestly, at no time was there a chance of Italy losing control of the air over Albania. The next day, November 3rd, the Greek counterattack continued. The men came out of their mountain hideouts and engaged the Italian divisions. As well-aimed mortars started raining down on the advanced units of the invaders, the Italians were confused by the intensity of the attack as the Greeks had been expected to surrender any day now. Perhaps there was a breakdown in communication between the Greek frontline troops and Athens. Hi, I'm Nathaniel Lloyd, host of Historical Blindness, the podcast about historical mysteries, myths, and frauds. With so many working from home these days, we become our own taskmasters making ourselves feel guilty about taking any time to have a bit of fun when we think we should be doing something productive. The truth is that self-care increases productivity, and taking a little break here and there to enjoy yourself can make you more focused when you return to the tasks you've set yourself. Good thing the puzzle adventure game Best Fiends is always within reach so that you can reward yourself with some hard-earned fun. I find time to play between tasks as a palate cleanser when I need to shift gears. I'm only on level 143, but there's always so much new content, new characters, and new seasonal events. There's an endless supply of fun to inject into my day. You've earned your fun time. Go to the App Store or Google Play to download Best Fiends for free. Plus, earn even more with $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best fiends. 
near the Lampishtit area, where the three borders intersect. General Yakomoni used one of his best Albanian units to disrupt the Greek artillery attack on his fellow Italians. The Greeks were dislodged from their hill, but a quick counterattack saw them recapture it. But the Albanians kept running, and all cohesiveness as a unit was undone. As other Italian forces were brought up to regain control, they tried to stop and reorganize the Albanians. However, the Albanians had no intention of stopping and started firing on the Italians. So, soon the Albanians were being hit from behind with Greek machine gun fire and mortars, and from in front by Italian artillery fire, now angry at being shot at. Combined, these attacks nearly decimated the Albanians. Out of the original 1,000, only 120 survived that day. As for the Julia Division, their job being to cover the left flank of the main attacking force, soon found themselves in an ever-increasingly troubled situation. The Greeks to their north were pushing west from western Macedonia and were soon cutting their supply line. In their front, the Greeks there engaged them only enough to stop any further advancement. But the Greeks behind them used their mobility, they were mountain cavalry, to harass and destroy the Italian troops and equipment in the rear. The advance had been checked, but neither could the Julia Division retreat. Back to the west, the main attack from the Siena Ferrara and Centauro divisions was also checked. No matter which way the Italians moved their men, there always seemed to be a higher point nearby. And in no time, the Greeks were there, well entrenched and devastating the closest Italian troops with mortar attacks. The general of the 1st Greek Corps was thankful for the time Mussolini's indecisiveness gave his troops for training. In desperation, the main attack force and the Julia Division tried to link up, but the Kalama River, Greek minefields, and constant attacks kept that from happening. As the reports of the setbacks reached Rome, Mussolini raged, and Chief of Staff Bagdolio couldn't help but lament the 600,000 men just recently released and sent home for the harvest. On November 5th, before the Greek counteroffensive could even be recognized for what it was, Churchill, in a secret session of the House of Commons, put some points before his audience. One, the joint Greek agreement between France and Britain to help Greece was not useful, as France no longer existed. Two, the Greeks had been so diligent at their neutral stance that Britain really did not know their military situation, or intentions. Three, Britain's priority was Egypt, as in their Mediterranean strategy. Why? This is best answered in the words of the British minister in Cairo, who said on November 13, 1940, quote, Just as London is the heart of the empire, so is Egypt the lungs. It wouldn't help at all to lose the UK and save Egypt. Scarcely less would it help to save Greece at the cost of losing Egypt. Unquote. No, the best that could be done for now was to send a force to Crete to allow the 5th Division there to fight on the mainland. By November 6th, it was clear to those on the ground that the initiative in this war was now with the Greeks. General Prescott decided that the Julia Division should retreat. Better to live to fight another day. But due to confusion and a breakdown in communications, the troops of Julia did not get the order until the next day. Not that it would have mattered. As they moved out, now heading north, they found substantial Greek forces blocking their way. But the fearful and enraged Italians did not have the opportunity to engage an enemy that would stand and fight. The Greeks moved constantly, always attacking the Italian column's sides and rear. It seemed that the Greek plan was to let the enemy leave, 
but it also seemed certain that the Greeks were intent on killing as many invaders as they could on their way out. But now, in a panic, the Italians did not move north in an organized fashion. Instead, the units disintegrated and ran for the mountains. The momentum of the main Italian attack had equally switched to the Greeks. And although they didn't have the force to push the Italians back, the Kalama River was where they were checked. Some of the Italians there panicked, threw their weapons down, and tried to swim back across the river. Their bodies were found miles downstream. The news coming out of Greece was that the Italians to the east had been pushed back into Albania. Another Italian army was retreating. The main attack was stalled. But was this all true? Could this all be true? Or was this Italy feigning weakness to draw the British in from Egypt to reduce their numbers there? Still, the British honored their commitment of support in the form of the RAF and money. Air Vice Marshal D'Albiac hastily gathered a collection of lemons and gladiators from Egypt and bombed the Valona airfield in Albania. The British bombers sortied without fighter escorts, but instead used the mountains as cover. Also on November 6th, London gave Greece a credit of five million pounds sterling. By November 8th, U.S. President Roosevelt was as stunned as everyone else. He had Lincoln McVeigh, the U.S. minister to Greece, deliver a congratulatory message from him to Metexas. The Prime Minister's only reply was to ask for aircraft. McVeigh dutifully sent it on, knowing the outcome. The response was, Britain comes first. Metexas reply to this was simply an unvarnished pleading for help. By November 10th, the invasion and initial counterattack was over. The main Italian thrust was checked, and the Greeks had pushed back on two other fronts, one guarding the Yugoslav border and the other against the Julia division. The remnants of some invading units were scurrying back north, while 3,500 Italian prisoners were taken to Athens. Who's to say which group was luckier? Leland Stowe of the Daily Telegraph wrote, quote, Surely this Greek army today is just about the highest spirited army in the world. Regardless of mud, rain, and snow, day after day, they march on. End quote. But the Greeks had used up the majority of supplies and resources they had. Still, those losses were partially made up from the equipment some Italian units left behind. But there could never be enough boots for the Greek troops whose own had fallen apart after almost two weeks in the mountains, nor enough blankets, especially after a fire in Athens had destroyed over 200,000 of them before the start of hostilities. During this unbelievable turnaround of military fortune, General Prasca offered up excuse after excuse and Mussolini had passed those excuses, the weather, the season, the mountain ranges, on to Hitler. But now, embarrassed beyond all measure, Il Duce had Prasca placed on permanent leave on November the 11th. New blood was needed. But the Greeks weren't finished pushing back yet. As it appeared that the Bulgarians were not coming across the border, many of the men from the IB line in the east, were transferred west to help push the Italians out of Greece. But now that skies were clear, the invaders would bring to bear their best advantage over Greece, their air force. After all, Mussolini had made sure that 196 bombers, 171 fighters, and 25 reconnaissance aircraft were committed to the Greek war. Clearly, it was past time to use them. But as stressful and embarrassing as this conflict was for Il Duce, it was about to get much worse. Admiral Andrew Cunningham was aggressively pursuing his Mediterranean war, 
but his responsibilities were growing, and Crete was about to be added to his list. Though outnumbered, he had to maintain control of the central Mediterranean, and as far back as 1935, the British believed that the answer to that conundrum was by attacking the Italian warships at Taranto. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So, as I record this, we have survived our first major snowstorm of maybe over an inch. I'm not sure. Uh, we're all pretty scared here, but uh, I got to come home early from work and record this, so something good came out of it. Um, just a couple things, and then I'll let you go. Um, the China History Podcast with Laszlo Montgomery is finally on Facebook. I've been harassing him for over a year, so he's finally on Facebook. Uh, so give him a search. Find him. Give him a like. I'm sure he'd really appreciate it. And again, his um, series on Hong Kong is really amazing. And just yesterday, I did another interview with Terry Koenig. We were on the Spectral Retrospective show. Uh, that was with Terry Koenig and Frank Todaro. We had a lot of fun. We talked about the Nazi bell. Was it a anti-graph propulsion system? Was it an, a precursor to an EMP um, weapon? Was it a time machine? So we talked about that and all the things we could we could dig up. I've done a couple shows with Terry on Paranormal A Radio. We talked about Hitler and Himmler in the past, so I'm sure you could search those. So you can find the show. If you go to iTunes and you search Paranormal A Radio or blog talk, I'm sure you can find it, or either one of their names. And they're also going to start uh, reposting my shows on their Saturday afternoon broadcast. So for those of you who live up Canada Way, you'll get to hear um, some of the older episodes as they um, try to help me out, and I really do appreciate it, and I look forward to coming back on their show uh, anytime they want me to. And as far as the tour, the tour is looking good. I've been speaking with my rep with educational services, and we're going to talk details tomorrow. So it looks like we're going to give it another try. So for everyone who sent in an email, I've got all those. I'm ready to, to send them on so you can get some information. Again, if you're keenly interested in a tour this year, just send me an email, ray at worldwar2podcast.net. I'll send it on, and we will get you the details as soon as we can. So... Um, hopefully this is going to work this time. I really want to get over there and see these sites. Um, it means more to me than I can possibly say, and hopefully it's going to happen this time. Before I get to the last part, the donations, um, I want to make a, a major announcement that I've been threatening or promising to do for the last seven or eight episodes. Um, starting sometime in February, I'm not sure when because I'm still working out the technical uh, details uh, of which you know that I'm challenged. Um, I am going to start offering up membership episodes. Now, before I start getting death threats through the email, uh, please know that the history of World War II podcast is not going to change one tiny little bit. I'm going to bring you the episodes as fast as I can with as much detail as I can. Absolutely nothing is going to change. But it's occurred to me that as I look back, I turn around and I look back at all these books um, covering some of the stories behind the main story of World War II, and we've already passed by them. Um, if I try to incorporate every little thing that I've read um, or have come across, we probably still wouldn't even be to the Battle of Britain. So here's my proposal to you. The regular podcast will stay as is, no changes, but once I get everything up and running, and you'll be able to see the details on the website, um, for a modest fee for the price of a cup of coffee at Starbucks or something, uh, you can get two additional episodes a month. And what I'm going to do is just to keep it simple is always to keep the membership episodes behind our main timeline. So there's no confusion or anything like that, but there's just so many little stories um, besides the main story that I wanted to offer up. I just didn't want the books that I bought with your uh, donation money to just sit there and go to waste. So I'm going to start doing that sometime in February. So hopefully you'll consider it. If you've ever wanted to support the show, um, please consider signing up. And hopefully I'll be able to bring more detail to you uh, because we all know the broad strokes of World War II. It's the details, I think, that that makes the show uh, worth listening to. So I hope to do that uh, even more. And, of course, the fantasy, the goal one day, is to be able to do podcasting full-time. So 
if I ever get enough members, and to be honest, I haven't worked out the numbers, so I don't know what exactly that means, um, here's my promise or my proposal to you. If I can do this full time, I will work very hard to give you four normal, regular shows each month. And then the, obviously the members would get two additional shows. So um, that would be my promise to you to put out a lot more than I am now because of work and everything else. But I, I really think I could do it. Also, one other thing, there is another podcast that I've been dying to do. I actually tried to start it up a year ago, but it's so vast and it's James Michener-esque scope that there's no way I could do this podcast and that one at the same time while I'm working and commuting and, and all that kind of stuff. So if I can get enough members, um, give you three to four episodes of the regular podcast, two episodes of the membership, and another whole podcast altogether that I really think you'll like. I don't want to say what it is yet because I don't want anybody to take it away from me, but I'm really excited about it. And uh, so please, if you've ever thought about supporting the show, just consider that. Go to the website, worldwar2podcast.net, uh, sign up for membership. But this way you're actually getting something out of it, and I certainly hope you enjoy it. And if you ever have an idea for a membership episode, let me know. Um, I'll be happy to look into anything that I can get information on. And now I would like to thank those of you who have donated to the show to keep this whole thing going. Uh, Beatrice R. in Enmore, New South Wales, Australia. Thank you very much. Um, Neil B. from High Wickham, Buckinghamshire in the UK. Thank you very much. And then Jamie B. from Brighton, East Sussex in the UK. So thank you very much. And now I can go work on episode 70. So again, I want to thank Professor Lambert for being on. And he pointed out a lot of good sources to me. So um, I will try to give you as much detail as I can. Because the story behind the attack actually starts in some ways in 1935. So I'll do a couple episodes, cover that, and then jump back into Greece as the Greeks push the Italians almost back into the Adriatic Sea. So I will see you as soon as I can. Um, thank you for listening. And as usual... Take care, everyone.